Well, anyway, uh, I'm sure that you're probably all aware, acutely aware, that we're in a presidential election year. And you're probably also aware that the political climate is very divisive. And I tend to avoid talking about politics in Buddhist settings for the simple reason that I think we need a safe place to go uh, where we can experience peace in, in amid uh, all the all the chaos and everything. Um, and it is difficult sometimes to talk about these things without dividing people. Um, so let me just say at this point, doesn't matter what's on your voter's registration card. Oneness is not dualistic. Doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or Green Party or Bull Moose Party or unaffiliated or whatever, you have Buddha nature. And so in a very real way, those identities like that are arbitrary and ephemeral. Um, Buddhism is a practice, and that practice is based around two main things, living wisely and living compassionately. So that includes recognizing that, the, the inherent Buddha nature in everyone, and it includes recognizing that self-identities are empty and intangible. But that said, I get asked sometimes to weigh in on day-to-day -day matters, politics included, um, and I usually have those conversations in private so that I'm not pulling other people into it. But I'm getting a lot of questions these days, but not really about political positions as much as how to navigate the divisiveness itself. And that's important. So for instance, I, I got an email last week from a Buddhist friend who felt like they were constantly being dragged into a dark place by the increasingly angry political speech, as they put it. It's so hard to avoid. Anytime we watch or read the news or scroll through social media or even engaging in casual conversation with neighbors, this stuff comes up. And he said the constant bombardment of anger and fear was creating a climate of hatred even among some of the peaceful, spiritually minded friends that he had. So I'm going to try to address this. Now, I don't keep my political views secret, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Most of you can probably know which way I vote, but that's not really what I want to discuss. And I promise you that if you vote differently than I do, I'm not going to scold you or unfriend you or anything like that. You know, we all deserve compassion. Um, in fact, the person that I sent the email that I mentioned was wondering, how can we use our Buddhist practice to disengage from the hate around us? He said, it's one thing to take the Bodhisattva vows in the temple, but how can we bring those vows into the real world, the world that we live in every day? And it's a very good question. And if I told you, look, well, the answer is just disengage from the political process. Don't worry about any of this stuff or anything like that. Just go meditate and let the world go by. That's not a very satisfying answer. And honestly, it's not very responsible. You know, we, the, the Buddha didn't tell, told the monks, you know, to go off and meditate in caves and under trees, but he also advised kings and business people and people who lived in the world. And, and so he wanted people to be able to live responsibly within society. I was at White Sands Buddhist Center one Saturday during one of those one day events. This was a long time ago. And there had just been a, um, an article in the newspaper down there in, in the Space Coast about White Sands. And it mentioned that there was this one day event coming up. And so about two and a half times the normal number of people had shown up for it. And the abbot was just like freaking out <laughs> because there are all, all these people like, how are we going to feed everybody? Where are we going to put everybody? All this. So there's all this, all this freaking out going on, you know. And I said to Venerable Kai Tien, you seem stressed. <laughs> and he said, yes, I'm very stressed. And I said, you're a Zen master. Zen masters don't get stressed out. And then I laughed, of course, because Zen masters do get stressed out. And he looks at me and goes, we have to live in the world. Well, we do. We have to live in the world, you know. And sometimes we live in a world where, you know, things aren't necessarily going the way that makes it easy. And we're human beings, and we, so we react to those things. 
And we live in a world where there's injustice and where there are existential threats like climate change and there are real, real dangers to democracy here and around the world. And there's war and oppression of people based on ethnicity and gender and sexuality and religion and a lot of the other problems that will continue and, you know, and, and they'll get worse if human beings don't do something about them. And then to make matters even more frustrating, you know, there's people who get paid a whole lot of money to promote a certain message and they don't get paid to tell the truth. So it's difficult, you know, to figure out what to do. And we'll feel threatened by those conditions and not without justification. And yet the Buddha says hatred is never appeased by hatred in this world. By non-hatred alone is hatred appeased. This is law eternal. So the Buddha didn't say this is law eternal very often. So you know that he meant that this is important to react to hatred with non-hatred. But it's hard to do that. It's hard to be non-hateful when we're surrounded by hate, to be peaceful when we're surrounded by violence, to battle ignorance with compassion to those who are lost in a world of confusion. And I wish that I could just give you a simple meditation technique that would make it easy to keep a calm and happy mind. But the reality is it's hard not to get sucked into this stuff. But I'll share with you a few thoughts that maybe you can try and that I hope will help. Things that I do, ways that I disengage from you know the rumination and, and stuff that goes on in my mind. So first, Keep in mind that there are, as I said, there are people who get paid a lot of money to keep us hating each other. That's been a part of politics for as long as there's been politics, probably. But it gets more and more sophisticated. And with social media and all that, it's harder to avoid. So, yes, you have Buddha nature and you're also human. And it's human nature that angry thoughts will arise and hateful thoughts and fears and all of those things. And you know, the three poisons are greed, hatred, and ignorance. Greed, you know, I'll be happy if I get more of what I want. And those, those people over there, they want to keep me from getting it. They want, or even take it away from me. You know, you see that messaging all the time. And the reason you see it is because it works. So don't let it work for you. Hatred. Ah, these bad people over here want to destroy everything I love. So I have to make them suffer, or at least not let them, you know, do this, what they're trying to do. And ignorance, delusion, misunderstanding, what leads to real happiness and what leads to suffering. You get what you want and these bad people suffer well, then you'll be happy. Well, that's not the way it works. It's the most deluded idea imaginable. And yet much of humanity buys into that. So recognize these thoughts when they arise and the feelings that arise associated with them. You know, we learn when we meditate that thoughts are just thoughts, they're not realities. We don't need to give attention to the thoughts that arise in meditation. We don't need to give attention to a lot of the thoughts that arise when we're going through life. So when greed, hatred, and delusion arise, we can let those things go. We can't prevent them arising sometimes, you know, that's not the way we're wired. Thoughts are not the self. We don't do anything to get them. They come up. Just see them as, as so and Roshi put it, as secretions of the mind. You know, they come up. How you respond to them is your responsibility. So if we work on cultivating kindness and wisdom, then we don't have to be ruled by them. Also, bear in mind that you might adore your chosen candidate or whomever, but your positive feelings for them doesn't prove that they're good. And despite how you feel about them, people who disagree with you and your candidate are not bad. They're just people. You know, I have a gift for being right. I've told you this before. I'm really good at being right. I know I'm good at it because my opinions feel really good to me. And because they feel so good to me, I'm sure they're the right opinions. But the truth is, no one side of any conflict is ever 100% right or 100% wrong. And very few great things are ever accomplished by any group of human beings without conflict. 
So, you know, I, I wrote about this in the White Sands newsletter and, and somebody pulled out a paragraph and was posting it, quoting me. So since this is apparently worth quoting it, I'll try to repeat it more or less the way I wrote it. It doesn't matter with in business, relationships, politics, conflict itself is not a problem. Problems arise from how conflict is communicated and managed. We actually need disagreement, but we need to disagree with skill. We might keep in mind that today's adversary may very well be tomorrow's partner. And so we should treat them with kindness and respect despite our disagreements. So don't think that everybody needs to agree with you. I was at a meeting not too long ago with a bunch of people that I like, and, and we were working together, leading an organization, and um, you know, that's important to all of us. And we were wrestling with some issue. I don't remember now what it was. It seemed really important at the time. And I had this idea about what I thought would be the best way to deal with this. But the conversation was going in a different direction. And I started thinking, well, I need to, maybe I need to push this, my viewpoint a little bit more, explain to people why, you know, why it's important. And I thought, you know what? I can just let them be wrong. And it was so weird. I, I lost all this stress. It just went away. It was okay to let them make a decision that was different than the decision that I would have made. Now, this wasn't a big existential crisis we were discussing, but we don't need to hold on to ideas about I'm right or you're wrong or anything like that. Yes, we're facing a number of serious problems as a society, and there'll be a lot of different ideas about what to do about them. The more we can disagree, the better the chances of finding the good solutions. You know, I have an MBA and I was in management for a number of years. And successful businesses have very innovative people and they have very careful people. And those two groups of people go together kind of like oil and water. But if you had a business that's only run by this incredibly innovative R&D team, or a business that's only run by the bookkeeping office, you've got a business that's probably going to fail. So accept disagreements as part of the process. Now that doesn't mean just be passive, let everything go. As I said, the Buddha advised monks whose job was to stay apart from worldly issues and meditate and all of that kind of stuff. But he also advised people who were in leadership in various capacities. And those people have to be able to navigate the world and conflicts and so on. He was also very accepting of other religious ideas. He didn't insist that everybody needed to convert to Buddhism. But he wasn't afraid to point out foolishness in the right time and place. And that's important. Pick the right time and place and the right words to use when something needs to be said. And one of the things that I find happens a lot of people bring to me is, you know, you get overwhelmed by the number of things that you see that needs to get fixed. Well, you can't fix everything. So pick things that are important to you. If you want to be an activist, pick the things that are that deserve your attention the most or that you have a gift for or that you have time for and the capacity for. There's pretty much nothing to be gained from scrolling nonstop through social media or keeping the cable news network going all the time. You're not going to solve any problems by doing that. So find things that you can do and also be careful about the things that you can't do. Remember, the Buddha's teaching boiled down to do good, avoid evil, purify the mind. So you're meditating. That's a, that's a good thing to be doing. That purifies the mind. Let go of greed, anger, and delusion when they arise. The more you get, the more you practice letting go of those things, the better you get at it. And keep in mind that we live in a world where everything changes everything changes and everything is interdependent so this election cycle will end soon actually thank goodness so do what you can that's important to you and then keep going so i hope that this was helpful i'm uh, interested in hearing the questions that you have if you want to unmute yourself
So, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not going to just go away because you want it to go away, right? Anger arises, you know, and first of all, practice developing loving kindness for everyone. Practice having compassion for everyone. It makes it, it dilutes the effect of the anger if you can do that. Don't, don't think I shouldn't get angry, you know. <laughs> Sensei Morris said I shouldn't get angry, therefore I'm not going to get angry. No, it doesn't work. Anger arises. See it as, as um, you know, as what it is, and let it and let it go that way. And when it comes up again, let it go again. Bringing yourself to the present moment and what's actually going on. You know, one one of the problems is not that anger arises; it's that we we let it hook us and we just keep thinking about it over and over again. So. You know, if you're if you're angry, where is your attention? It's in the past, probably. It's in something that happened. Or it may be in something that you think might happen. What's really going on right here, right now? And so when we get in the habit of bringing ourselves into this moment, then what's going on right here, right now? Well, you might have certain feelings in your body. Okay, they're just feelings in your body. And then you're giving meaning to those feelings. So when you stop giving meaning to them, they're just feelings in your body. Um, you know, the, the best advice I think I could give you is just to try. I think you know how to practice metta bhavana, developing goodwill. The more you do it, the more you'll have of it. And it's not going to happen instantaneously. You know, you have to work at it. Be kind to yourself. You know, don't don't beat up on yourself for having these thoughts, but don't give them a lot of credibility either. You know, you can think about people like the Dalai Lama, who talked about Mao as being his greatest teacher, <laughs> you know, because he gave, gave him a lot of stuff to be angry about. And so he had to work on that. And so, you know, you can see these people as your teacher. Um, and, you know, it's not easy to do, but also look and go, okay, so what can I do right now? Being angry is not getting anything done. What can I do that will accomplish something? <laughs>